Yeah, what a privilege, what a thanks to the Lord to be here among you. You don't see me as me, you see me as part of Israel in the Philippines. And today I know that the Lord will touch, really touch you in a very special way. And first of all, because you're seeking, you're seeking, you want it, you ask it, and the Lord said, if you knock, it will be open. If you seek, you will find. The Lord said it, promised it. The Lord said, and I'm here to help you to open things, you see, to open things. What happened with our country, with Israel, is a miracle that cannot be compared to any other miracle. And God, in His grace, gave me to be the last 71 and a half years, which is my age, to be really part of everything that happened in our country. Not only the wars, which of course, if you are in Israel, you get it, but mainly the spiritual war which is much harder, the spiritual war. Because as we will see now, this land was born in one night. Nine, one night the land was born. And immediately as it was born, there were seven countries that wanted to wipe it, to take it away. My father got a bullet in his head. We almost, all, we were three children then. We were almost killed because of the attacks that were on our home in Jerusalem. So, beyond every, against all odd, God kept us and we survived. In the independent war, 1940, Eight, actually started in 1947. We lost 1% of our population. We had 600,000 Jewish people in the land. 6,000 of them were killed. Just imagine, compare it to your population. And this was after Second World War, after we already lost six million in Europe. We were dry bones. If somebody will say that in so short time these dry bones are going to be a nation that has their language again, and we will talk about the secret of the language, the Hebrew language, is maybe the most miraculous tool that God gave us in order to see Yeshua in the Bible, that he is the Son of God, the Hebrew language. And this Hebrew language was sealed, it was locked from us for 2,000 years. Like the hieroglyphic language, like the Koine Greek. The Hebrew was the same. And as we will see in a moment, the secrets of the land of Israel and the secret of the language of Israel are key elements to find the savior of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach. The two names, Yeshua, that of Yeshua is Yeshua. What is the meaning Yeshua? You call him in all kind of language for the last 2,000 years. Jesus, 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 Jesus. No one of these names hold the secret of Yeshua. Because Yeshua is come from Yesha. Lehoshia. What is Lehoshia? To save, to save, to save. 
You understand when we talk about Yeshua, we in our language, we all the time, his name is the Savior. And look, it's not only the name Yeshua, the Savior, and that's why we call him Yeshua and not Jesus. Sorry, I ask, you're apologizing. But all the big, the great prophets that taught about him, they are carrying the same name. Miraculous. You call Isaiah. His name is Yeshayahu. What is Yeshayahu? You hear Yeshua, Yeshayah. You hear, you hear the connection, Yeshua, Yeshayah. Is God is the Savior. Isaiah, from around 120 prophets about Jesus in the Bible, which are cited in the New Testament, Isaiah alone has more than 30 prophecies. Another prophet, Hosea, you call him. In Hebrew, Hosea. Hosea. What is Hosea? You hear the name? Yeshua, Hosea? The same. God is the Savior. Another name, Joshua. Joshua that came after Moses, right? To lead Israel to enter to the promised land. What is Joshua in English, in Hebrew? What is the meaning? Yehoshua. Try to say it with me. Yehoshua. It comes in two words. Yeho. What is Yeho? Beginning of the name of God that we Jewish people don't mention it. What is called Jehovah. Jehovah. This is the most holy name of God, which we don't use it. By not using it, you keep it, the first commandment that God gave in Exodus. Don't use my name in vain. So, the name Yehoshua, what you call Joshua, is Yeho, Yehovah, Yehovah is the Savior. Is the Savior. So you so you see what happens here. Yeshua as the Savior appears in all these names, biblical names that are prophesying or acting or bringing the land. The, the Jewish people to their land are all connected to the name Yehoshua Yeshua. For 2,000 years, it was hidden. It was hidden because we didn't have the Hebrew language. We were far away from our land and from our language. It meant nothing. What is the connection between Jesus to Joshua? It, it, it doesn't fit together. The miracle of the name. Take another name. Mashiach. We believe in Yeshua HaMashiach. What is Mashiach? It comes from the root Mashoch. What is Mashoch and Mashoach? Anointing. So Mashiach is the anointed one. Does Mashiach appear in the Bible? Yes, of course. When David was hiding from Saul, running away from Saul, two times in chapter 24 and in chapter 26 of 1 Samuel, he was in a situation that he could kill, get rid of Saul. He was. And the people around him told him, this is the day that the Lord did. He brought your enemy under you. Come on, do it. David said, Halila li me Adonai, lifgoa ba Mashiach Elohim. It is forbidden for me from God to touch whom? The anointed Mashiach one. 
and this is Mashiach in the Hebrew text, Daniel that prophesied 2,500 years ago, in chapter 9, he calls, he says the word so clear, 70 of years, of, of weeks of years are going and decided for your nation. And what will be after the 62 weeks of years? Mashiach ikaret ve'elo. Mashiach, you see the word? Mashiach will be cut and will not be anymore. And then he says, till this time, Mashiach nagid, using again the word Mashiach, will be given to us. Just two words. Yeshua Mashiach were hidden from us 2,000 years. And the language, the power of a meaning of a name, this is one of the most powerful things that really belongs to the name. Why to talk it out from him? If my name is Arye Yehuda Bar David, Lion of Judah, son of David. This is the name that my parents gave me 71 and a half years ago. So that's why I'm glad when you call me Arye, short of Arye Yehuda. You call me Lion, Arye. But there is so much behind this name that they gave because name is prophecy. There is prophecy behind the name. So God gave us miraculous thing that he revived our names, our language. And we again can call someone by his name with the full meaning which is behind the name. I want to continue one more thing. All the disciples that were living around Jesus 2,000 years, they talked Hebrew. Not Greek, not English, not Filipinos. They talked Hebrew mixed with Aramaic words that they brought from Babylon diaspora. We have in our language several hundred words, Aramaic words that enter to our language and they are going together. Jesus on the cross when he said, Eli, Eli, Lama, Azavtani, and you find Eli, Eli, Lama, Shevaktani. Shevaktani is in Aramaic. Azavtani is in Hebrew. Today we use these two words the same. We say somebody that passed away, Lishvok Chaim. And if you ask a man in the street, in which language is Lishvok Chaim, he will say Hebrew, of course Hebrew. I know that it's not Hebrew. Originally it is Aramaic. But, but you understand, we became our language now so rich then it became the same, Hebrew and Aramaic. There is no way to open Mashiach, Yeshua, in the Old Testament without the language. This is the first thing I want to say. For 2,000 years, Yeshua HaMashiach was hidden, also for the Gentiles. The power that has in his name because of the language. When Yeshua was just a little one, a little baby, look, the angel appeared to Joseph and he said, you call your son Yeshua because he will save his nation. He appeared to Simon, remember Shimon, old man in the temple. And he was the same, he said, this young baby, eight days old, 
was just a baby, and they brought to circumcise here. His name will be Yeshua. He will save his people. Yeshua and save are the same word in Hebrew. So always Yeshua, the name, even then, was going with the action that he will do. Lehoshia, to save Israel and all the world. And now, we want to go several steps before we continue. And if you will have a good picture of the map of Israel, I would like also just to put it on the screen. And if, yeah, very good. The map is coming. Is there any pointer? Excellent map. Bravo. I like it. Yeah. If you bring me a pointer. Look at this map of Israel. This is the land of Israel. And God sees it from above. And so many times it's good to look at the mysteries that are in the land. These mysteries were hidden from us 2,000 years. Because we were spread all over the world. But God promised already in Leviticus chapter 26, I'm going to bring you back to your land. Because God made a covenant not only with people like Noah, Abraham, David, Yeshua, he made also a covenant. Thank you very much. Great. Also he made a covenant with the land of Israel. When he turned to Abraham, Genesis 12, he told him, go forth south, north, east, west, because everywhere that you will step, I give it to you. This is your land. He never pointed on New York, or London, and Paris, and told us that this will be our land. Praise the Lord. Only one spot, little spot, in the globe. This is the land. And the connection of the land of Israel with the language of Israel with the Savior of Israel. This is a triangle that impossible to take it apart. Impossible. This triangle, which is the basic of so many prophecies that we'll see later on, we have several hours today. It is the basic of our faith, our existence, who we are, what we are. Remember this point. So let us see a little bit of the mysteries that we have in Israel. Let us put again, I point to this map, tell me if you can see the pointer. Yeah, uh, if I point here it should, okay. Maybe too weak. Yeah, it's too weak, maybe. Never mind. If I stand there, it will help you. Yeah, I didn't bring my laser. I have a strong laser one. Okay, thank you. This can be. Oh, bravo. I want you to see a little bit what is hidden in this map of Israel. We see the shores, the Mediterranean. We see the mountains of Israel. We see the Jordan Rift, Arava, Dead Sea, Jordan Rift that goes all the way up. And then we see the Trans-Jordan Mountains. You see very clear four four lines that go from south to north. Again, the shores of Israel, the mountains, we call it the rift, the rift 
and again the mountains of Israel. So what? It happened. No, no, there are a lot here that I can tell you, a lot of this. So I will do it this way, if you don't mind. I don't know if this is movable, right? But if it's movable, I can move it alone. Yeah, bravo, excellent. So let me do it such a way. Now it's okay. Good. Mm. And we put it here. Excellent. Excellent. You see, this is what I like because uh, I move it a little bit backwards. I do it alone. I was carpenter 20 years. I can know how to move things. Okay. Uh, I say many times, I'm a man of mountains on hills, not <laughs> really air conditioned holes. And that's why we, last moment, we find something, a branch, a stick, and we use it. Thank you for this beautiful stick. <laughs> Let us see some of the mysteries of this land. All this part that I'm showing here, the coast, the coast of Israel was covered for 2,000 years by swamps swamps. Not only the coast, all this valley, Jezreel Valley was covered by swamps. Also this part where is the Sea of Galilee all the way to Bechan, covered by swamps. Swamp is good thing or bad thing? You'll think bad thing, right? Even terrible. Why sickness, malaria, anopheles, you know, I can, I want to tell you that swamp is one of the greatest blessings that happened to our country. Why? Because when God promised to bring us back to this land after 2,000 years, how you do it? Can you tell somebody, can you promise him to bring him to his home after 40 years if he left it? You know the rules nowadays. If somebody was living there 40 years, he said, you cannot take me away. What is the meaning? 40 years I'm living here. How you can bring me here? I, I mean, how you can take me and, and bring somebody else? God promised to bring his people 2,000 years later. How he kept it? By making it swamp. Nobody wants to live in this house. It's smelling. Why to live? Israel was under more than 14 big empires. The last one was the Ottomans, the Turkish. 400 years the Turkish were here. You know how they call this part? Because they had a huge empire. The cursed land. Why they called it the cursed land? because of all the swamps that were here. So they didn't care about this piece of land. They had so big empire, all North Africa countries, all the way to India, half of Europe, to Vienna was in their hand. Who cares about this piece which is smelling bad? And the same like the Ottomans did, Many other empires did. Many. I would say all of them. So the swamp let, left this piece of land that no civilization started in this land in these 2,000 years. You understand the miracle? The last civilization was when Solomon and David were here. And from that on, never, never any, any civilization was here. It was waiting to their children to come back. And it was waiting for 2,000 years and the children came. What is the meaning the children came? 160 years ago, 
In this land, there were only 7,000 Jewish people. This is according to the Ottoman census. You know where they were? In four cities. They were here in Hebron, Bethlehem, Tiberia, and Shephat. That's all, 7,500 Jewish people. If somebody in those days will say that God is going to make a big nation here, 8.3 million people will live here. Come on, don't tell me tales. Cannot be. Most of these 7,500 Jews were old people. And they came mainly to Jerusalem, 6,000 people, to die there. They wanted to die and to be buried on Mount of Olives. Look how God did it. 150, 60 years ago, if people will talk about replacement theology, I understand why they say so. I understand logically who could believe that this dead bone, a good big nation, is going to be with one of the best armies in the world. Who could believe it? So replacement theology fitted. Perfect. But look what happens. Look what happens in front of our eyes. 1947, we entered to a war. Why? Not because we wanted. The United Nations gathered together 29 November and decided that Israel has right to have home for the Jewish people after the Holocaust. Yeah, if you don't mind, I will do something. Tell me, don't be afraid. Okay, please. I can take this down and put it here. Or no, maybe it's too tight. Yeah, I, I just want to be able to climb also here. I can do it this way and finish, right? Come on, I told you I'm a man of the, the hills and the valleys. Nobody would believe, nobody will believe Again, I, I go back that here in this land, there will live 8.3 million Israelis. We had to pass Holocaust for this. And it happened. And I praise the Lord, the third generation of Jewish people that was born in my land on Mount Olives, born to the Hebrew language. And here in Israel, the reborn Israel, for me to believe in Yeshua is the most natural thing. And I tell you why. Because According to Moses, the rabbis were pointed to be the one to tell us what is right in front of God, what is not right. According to Moses, right? I come to my rabbi, so-called, okay? Rabbi, tell me. For 70 years, in the days of Jeremiah, we were in exile. Yes, you are right. Rabbi, why we were in exile 70 years? Can you tell me? And he will tell you because all the sabbatical years that you didn't keep in the land. You know, every seven years, the Jews had to leave the land, not tilt it, not work it, and all the fruit that continued to come was for the poor people, for the widow, for the orphans, for the strangers, and even for the beast and the animals. You are not allowed to sell it, you are not allowed to deal with it. It's not economy, no. Every seventh year has to be sabbatical year. And God warned very careful in, let 
Leviticus 26, if you write notes for yourself, Leviticus 26, a key chapter, it warns every sabbatical year, seventh year, that you will not keep my word. I count it. Seven years passed, another seven, another seven, another seven, and you know, human being, ah, God forgot what he said in Leviticus. He forgot it. It was so long time ago. <laughs> Seventy sabbatical year passed. Very important number. Seventy. Boom. Babylonians are coming, conquering the land, the Muhadnezar, and takes all of us to exile. And Jeremiah warned us that God is going to send us to exile because we don't keep sabbatical year. Now it is, I don't know if you understand what is the meaning. Sabbatical year, if you, you don't know what it is almost. So many times people ask me today in Israel, they keep the sabbatical year. I said, of course they keep it. After you got punished so badly, you don't want to be again punished. So you keep it. If it's God regulation, you keep it. But Rabbi, I want to ask you, we have been 2,000 years out of our land. Please tell me why. I have a full legitimate to ask this question because I was born in Jerusalem. I don't want to find myself again in exile. Finished. Rabbi, you have to tell me what was wrong that we did, that God cast us for 2,000 years. You don't have to be a mathematician to see that it's 30 times more hard punishment than the sabbatical year. You see, 70 years, 2,000. What was our wrong? You know what is the answer? Sinat chinam. You know what is this? Vain hatred. Because of vain hatred. Aha, very interesting. I ask him, Rabbi, whom we hated in vain? Please. Ah, we hated each other. Come on, Rabbi. We are not stopped doing it 2,000 years. Oh, we did it in the days of Saul and Solomon and everything. What? Give me more concrete answer. Whom we have hated in vain. I tell you, Rabbi will not give you this answer. You know why? Because he doesn't have an answer. You see the point? He doesn't have the answer. So, I tell the rabbi, you don't tell me. It's my job to search and to study whom we hated in vain. Because this is not only my future. I want to raise family. I want to have children. I want to warn them whom we hated in vain. I'm go, going to have grandchildren. I want to warn them. I want to tell you that you rabbis don't have answer for me. But the word that had the answer of 70 years, in the word I will find the answer. Why 2,000 years? Whom we hated in vain. And I will say one more sentence to the rabbi. Praise the Lord, rabbi. The word is now in Hebrew. And from six years old, I started to read and to write this language. So thank you. I can find it alone. And I will find it. Only one we hated in vain. Only one. The only person that was living just before we went to exile, the only one that Daniel called him Mashiach, that Daniel said that Mashiach will be cut. Wow, Rabbi, this is very serious. We were cutting 
Mashiach? Tell me when we did it. You understand what happens? I opened the word. I found Zechariah chapter 12. In that day they will look on whom they have pierced. Rabbi, we never pierced somebody. No? Because according to the Jewish law, there are four ways to get rid of somebody. I mean, by stoning, by smoke, by sword, and by hanging. But we never pierced. Right, Rabbi? Yeah, we never pierced. But it's written that they will look on me whom they have pierced. So what is the meaning of pierced? Dekaru. Litkor. In which kind of these four execution, Jewish execution, according to the Bible, you are piercing somebody? In hanging? As I know, you put a rope. You don't pierce. Stoning? You throw stone, you don't pierce. Smoke, you take a torch. Burning, you put it in water when it's burning so it cannot burn. And then you take it out and big smoke, heavy smoke comes. <gasps> and they were putting in the victim in the second event. You see? So, in which one of them we have pierced? You understand why the Hebrew language is a must to understand who is Messiah? You will tell me you are right. But I will tell you, we pierced only one. Only one. This is the same one that is written in Daniel. We pierced him. And what the Bible says, that all will see whom they have pierced and mourn on him. Like you mourn on your first child. The house of David alone, the house of Nathan alone, the house of Shimei alone, the house of Levi alone. Rabbi, what are these houses? Of, about what houses he talks? He will tell you. These were the main four houses that run the nation of Israel. So what do you mean? It today like we'll say all the government will mourn on him. All the IDF will mourn on him. All the prime, I mean, uh, parliaments of Israel will mourn. You understand what I mean? It will be a national mourn. On whom? On one. Whom? That we have pierced. I open history books and I'm looking, looking very careful. What happened before we went to 2,000 years exile? What drastically thing happened? Aha, one thing. One thing. They wrote to Emmaus, Cleophas, and his friend were walking on the road, you remember? And suddenly Jesus joined and he looked at them and they were walking very quick, you know, like this. And talking with them, and they asked them, what, 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 what happened? Why, why, why you are so, you know? And they looked on him, are you the only stranger one in Jerusalem that doesn't know what happened? And Jesus looked on them and said, no, what happened? Oh, I like his sense of humor of Jesus, right? What happened? And you remember what I said? We had someone that we believed that he is the Moshiach, the Savior. And our top people got rid of him, crucified him, pierced him. Not stoned, not, 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 you understand? And we all hoped that he will save us. And then what he did on the road, he opened to them all prophets, all prophets, all Psalm, and all Moses. I want to give you quickly, we talk around 120 prophets, 
that are mentioned in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament. 33, four of them are in Psalm. The same 33, I mean, another number, 33, are in Isaiah, which means only in Psalm and in Isaiah, you have more than 50% of the prophets about Messiah fulfilled in the New Testament. All the rest are from all the other prophets and the other side. I mean, most, more than actually 56% of the prophets about Jesus are from where? Psalm and Isaiah. You see? So Jesus opened them, the Psalms, and when he opened them, the prophet, the main prophet with, what is the name? Yeshaya. Again, what is Yeshaya? The name of the prophet. Yeshaya, what is the name of this man? God's Savior. So the prophet God is the Savior, gave more than 25% alone about the one that is going to be one day the Savior, Yeshua. And that's why it took me more than six years to teach in our assembly Isaiah. You can't believe, six years it took me, word by word, sentence by sentence. Let me tell you that <laughs> There are not 33 prophets. When you know the Hebrew language, easily, easily 150 prophets. Easily. You can't believe what you find in Isaiah concerning God. But let us go back. Yeah. Good. Good to have this. You see, chapter 12. Verse 10, you are so quick with the PowerPoint, excellent, whom they have pierced. But let us go again to the map of Israel, if you don't mind, okay? So, we moved it so quickly, so well, if there is a kind of a small chair, I think I can manage with the chair also. Remember, I'm a park trooper, I'm not afraid of high places, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I still, I believe today I can easily jump, <laughs> easily, you know, because you, you know to do it, you know how to do it. The edge doesn't matter at all. Okay, let us look again a little bit about the mystery of the map. Somewhere here is Egypt, on the left side. And when the children of Israel left Egypt, they could do a very short way to enter to the land. Egypt in the Nile River, Goshen Delta is here. They could walk like this, enter to the land. But God said in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17 and 18, God didn't take them from the short way to the promised land because he didn't want them to meet enemies, the Philistines, war and run back to Egypt. Thank you, Pastor. I see that you are, ah, you can do it. Good. Para Very good. Paratrooper. Paratrooper. Yeah. <laughs> right. So look, instead of this, it took them down, down. If you have a map with Sinai, it's good. Down, down to Sinai to prepare them. To prepare them for what? For one year to be a nation. How he prepared them? He taught them about his regulation, about his name. I am El, not only El Shaddai, the name that I appear to Abraham, to Jacob, to Isaac, but I'm also Jehovah. And he says to Moses, in this name, I didn't appear yet. He gave them all the orders to build the tabernacle. And all the details in the tabernacle, because I'm holy. 
And no one can come to me, to my holiness. He continued and he gave them, he prepared them in details to be a holy nation. Because I chose you, he said to Moses and the children of Israel, to be example, a model to all the world. How I, God of all the earth, of all the nations, how I want to be worshipped. And he continued and said, I kept the seven nations that were in the land. They were 400 years here after he appeared to Abram. But they worshipped idols. And he warned us, if you will do what they did, I'm going to kick you out of your land that I promised to Abram. But I promise to bring you one day back. And now look, we go back to the map. So what God did, he didn't bring them the short way. He took them and brought them all the way, all the way, surrounded all the pa uh, south part and brought him to this point. This point that I'm showing you is called Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo is on the other side of the Jordan River. And look, we make it bigger, Mount Nebo. And here, the children of Israel were standing. And God told Moses, Moses, because of what happened in one of the situation in Numbers chapter 20 described that you didn't hallow my name but you took the roads most of you remember this and you were bidding right you will not enter the promised land you will die here on Mount Ebo but who will lead them into the promised land the one that you anointed him Yehoshua okay the name Yeshua he will bring them and he will help Yehoshua the land. And look what happens now. Yehoshua, which is the same name of Yeshua, had to bring them to the lowest place in the world because that's how God created the land that Every one of the Israelites that would enter to the promised land had to pass through the lowest point in the world. I think you don't have to, to think too much to understand it's a miracle. From all the big world that we know, how it happened at the lowest place, minus 1,300 feet or in meter 400 end, is here, where they had to cross the Jordan. Unless God created this way. Why? Because he wanted to show us there is a mystery here. We cannot conquer the promised land, not the physical land and not the spiritual land. Unless we die to ourselves. Unless we arrive to the lowest, lowest point that somebody can be. As I know, this is death. And only then, Yeshua, Yeshua, will start taking us to climb, to climb, to climb, to climb, to climb, till we will arrive at the top of Mount Olives. What a picture of what Jesus said to us, unless someone die to himself, die to himself and carry the cross, unless he's doing this, he's not a follower of me. And look now, when we walk, I mean, by Moses, Moses 
He could not inherit the land. He died here. But God took Joshua, and with him we had to cross and to climb all this. By Moses, you cannot inherit the kingdom. You cannot. All those that are backsliders, actually what they do, they were already here. They were baptized. In the Jordan River, we will see in a moment what is the meaning of the Jordan River. And they were called now to climb, to climb, to let Yeshua bring them to the kingdom. This is the physical, but there is, of course, the spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. And what they do when they forsake, they are going back here. You understand? Moses brought us very high. Look, I'm teaching a lot of the written law. A lot. Okay? Very high. But remember, this is the last point that you can arrive. Not more than this. In order to inherit the land, you have to be led to the lowest place in the world. And what is coming here in the lowest place in the world? What we have to cross. Again, the big map that we saw before. What we cross. How we call this river. Somebody knows? Jordan River. What is so special in the Jordan River? It's not a huge river. It's quite small. When Naaman, the chief staff of Syria, that came from Damascus, and he was leper. The daughter, young girl, told his wife, I, there is a prophet in Israel. He can help his leprosy. And Naaman left his place in Damascus with a lot of money, a lot of gifts, and arrived to Samaria to the king of Israel. I've heard that you... You can heal me from my leprosy. And the king was terrible afraid. Am I God that you came to me? And he got a message from Elisha. I want Naaman to know that there is a prophet in Israel. And Elisha was living here next to the Jordan River. And what he said when Naaman came, he wanted Elisha to heal him. You don't need me, sir. You don't need me. Dip seven times in the Jordan River. And it will be okay. What? In this river I will dip seven times? Comparing to the rivers that are going in Damascus. This is a joke. And he was so upset. I did all the journey to enter to this one. And the servants, the servants, always you find the servants. Wow, they have a great place in the kingdom of God. The servants, those that many times you almost don't right, notice that they are there. They came to him and told him, it's a great thing what this prophet tells you to do. It. Shall I expose my leprosy? In front of all of you. <laughs> I don't know if they told him, no, we, we will do like this, don't worry. Don't worry. Just do what this man told you. And he had to expose his leprosy. Expose to, his, to himself nakedness. He had to, because this is the regulation that Elisha told him. Go into the Jordan. And after you squelch, right? Right? How many times he did? You remember, seven times he was army man, so he could easily do it seven times. Right? Old men usually do it one time uh, and falling down. So, do it. And he did it. And what happened when he came out? His skin. Look, it's almost like a little child. Like a baby. So there is power in the Jordan River. 
There is mysterious power. Let us stop a moment and look again on the big map. What is the power from where the Jordan River starts? The Jordan River starts from a mount called Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon, up, up there. The only mountain that four months a year covered by snow. Three springs are appearing under the mountain, right? And they create together one spring, second spring, three, third spring, the Jordan River. And it goes down, goes down to Sea of Galilee. What is the mystery of this? Hebrew language again. Hermon, Herem, Haram in Arabic, in Hebrew, in Akkadian, in Babylonian, the most, most sacred. This is called Cherem, the most holy. God says, when you this, a conquer Jericho, all what is in the city is Cherem. It belongs to me. Belongs to me. It's Cherem. And there was one man that stole, you remember, some gold and hiding it, and then he perished all his family with him. Why? Because they touched the Cherem. So the name Hermon is very meaningful. And ancient times they believed that this was the place of God, the seat of God. I mean, the world idol worshippers. That is the most high place, by the way, the most high place in Israel, okay, around 9,000 feet, almost three kilometers high. Where, what is in the picture here? What is the symbolizing? The throne of God, the throne of God. And look now, beautiful, Yeshua Mashiach, that is illustrated like the Jordan River is coming like living water because this is how he called himself I am the living water that came from above 